What's up everybody? John Eric Poli here with my MMA news and today's guest will be fighting at Bellator 278 in the Bantamweight Grand Prix wildcard bout on April 22nd against Danny Sabatello. I am pleased today to be joined by Jordel Lugo here today. Jordel, thanks for being here, man. Really appreciate the time here. Uh, big fight coming up here for you. It's a great opportunity, so thanks for being here to uh, talk about it with us. Hey man, the pleasure's mine. Thank you for having me. Hey, no problem at all. So we'll start with this uh, opportunity for you here, right? Winner advances to fight uh, Leonardo uh, Ego. It's a huge opportunity, right, advancing the tournament here. Just talk about what this opportunity has got to be like for you to be in this Grand Prix because Bellator does a great job with all these to be recognized as one of the best band weights in the world. I'm sure it's just a, a big thing for you. Super, super big deal for me. Super excited for this opportunity, man. Um... God really blessed me because, you know, for me to be in the tournament, two people had to get injured and two people got injured, you know, and fell out of the tournament. So it gave me the opportunity to be in this wild card spot to earn my earn my spot in the tournament. So um, definitely just a huge blessing for me to be given this chance because, like I said, I wasn't supposed to be even be here in the first place, you know. And, I'm, and I just so happened to be ranked, you know, above guys who, who were fighting in the UFC like Brett Johns and – uh, Barzola, there's a lot of other guys that could have easily been in this position. So for me to be 8-0 you know, in this spot is, you know, dream come true. Yeah, and this is going to be a, a long road for you too, right, with this tournament because you have to obviously go through this wild card round and then that kind of gets into just the actual bracket itself. So when you look at this, like how do you get yourself ready not only physically but mentally to prepare for what could be a very long road to go from a wild card round to potentially being all the way to a championship fight there? I mean, I just came off a fight too in February, February 25th. So this is uh, this fight is less than two months from my last fight. This is only, uh, it's two days short of two months from my last fight, you know? So then two months right after that, I'll be fighting Leandro Higo. So it's gonna be, they're gonna have me really busy, but. You know, I've been, I've been preparing for this since I was a 14-year-old kid, and um, uh, physically and mentally, I'm prepared to do these things now. You know, I feel like uh, the Lord has blessed me with a lot of uh, skills and uh, mental sharpness, so um, it's, there's no better time than now for me to be in this spot. I wouldn't have been ready before, mm -hmm. you know, so I'm glad that it happened now because I'm prepared for it. And you just mentioned there too, right, about coming off a fight in February. I mean, that that's just difficult in itself to fight two months after uh, having a fight in February like that. What, what's kind of like your recovery like? I mean, because that, that's such a difficult thing to do. And from what I've gathered now from a few years of interviewing fighters, fighters often talk about, like, the key to staying active is not overdoing it in the gym. Uh, like a lot of fighters say they want to stay active, they try pushing themselves, pushing themselves, they end up getting injured. So for you, just talk about like the recovery end of it and, and kind of what some of your keys to being this active are. Yeah, you know, I was a little banged up, for, a, little, a little bit banged up from that fight. And um, like you said, it's, not, it's about not overdoing it, you know. So I only sparred one time for this fight. Um, I really didn't have much chance to spar too much. Um, but it's about recovery, you know. It's about, uh, it's about um, like... For example, I would, I would train, 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 and not get too much time like, to recover. So now, this time around, I've been much more focused on getting my sleep, much more focused on making sure I have my days off and things like that. So if I'm going to be fighting multiple fights back to back to back, recovery is more important now than ever. Mm -hmm. You know, So I, gotta, I have to make sure that uh, I master that part of my game, not just the training hard part. You know. So you mentioned there, you only sparred once during this whole entire camp. Uh, I know Max Holloway was kind of like the first guy that ever kind of brought this uh, to the forefront of like, you know, I've been fighting long enough where I don't have to be sparring every single day. I know what to do when I'm inside of there. Just kind of touch on that a little bit because it's obviously a unique thing to, you know, not be sparring so much during a fight camp. Yeah, well, you know, um, I feel like i come to learn that uh, the, the main difference between um, a good fighter and an amateur or somebody who's never fought before is range. You know, how close and how far is somebody from me? And um, range is something that I've been able to develop a really good understanding of throughout my career. So um, I haven't been sparring, but because my because I train, I drill so much, and I do so much range work, nothing's going to change. And I'm always still working on my reflexes. I'm always working on my range and things like that. So the things that you would get from sparring, I'm getting them in drilling and things like that anyway. So it's it, it's not a hundred percent necessary 
to spar so long as you've done a, so much sparring in the past and you've fought and you have a lot of experience in there already. So you talked a little bit about like sparring and different drills and whatnot, but just talk about camp overall here for this fight here and kind of how it's been going as you've been preparing now for a few weeks for this fight. Yeah, very, very uh, repetitious, a uh, repetitious camp uh, for me, you know, um, I was I put some things together specifically for uh, Dan Sabatello because his style is very, uh, you know, what you see is what you get. Uh, he does the same thing every time he fights, so it's, it's not really, um, that's the good part about it is that you kind of know what you're getting yourself into, so uh, we kind of just for, formulated um a uh, game plan around his style and we've just been doing the exact same things pretty much repeatedly so um i'm actually today was my last day of training so I'm, I'm actually glad to just relax now because you know doing the same thing over and over you know it's like you, eating the same food over anything that you do repeatedly gets like a little annoying after a while you know <laughs> i hear you there man and you mentioned about danny right too about uh how he's kind of fights pretty similar to every single one of his fights so you're kind of just drilling this repeatedly now, as you've been drilling and preparing, how do you see this fight, this fight playing out? Uh, you know, uh, on his part, he's going to go out there. He's going to shoot like he always does. Um, in the first round, he might put some punches before his shot. He'll do a little punch, 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 and then he'll shoot. He'll dive low and uh, go for my legs. That's pretty much what he'll do uh, about the whole time. Um, until after I get up or I stuff his takedowns, then his, he'll stop setting the takedowns up and he'll start just complete diving from my legs at that point, more desperation. And um, for me, I'll, I'll start taking advantage of uh, that that uh, that excited energy. And um, I'm very good at reading energy, you know, so uh, I'll take advantage of that and just implement my game, you know. Um, and that, uh, you know, that stand-up or on the ground doesn't really make too much of a difference for me. But um, as long as we shut his game down, the rest of the fight will be cake. So you said something that was interesting to me. I've never heard a fighter mention this before. You said you're good at reading people's energy. Explain that a little bit. That has to be something that's I find very difficult. Like I, I mean, maybe I'm not used to reading people's poker faces. How are you able to to gauge somebody's energy when you're inside the cage there? Well, you know, I believe you know God has blessed everybody with certain talents and different and different gifts. You know, so I might be good at one thing, but you're good at other things that I'm not good at. You know. Um, but I just so happen to be blessed with like a, a strong sense of empathy and um, I can feel emotions and feel energies very, very, very well. You know, um, they usually say females are the most empathetic, but I feel like my empathy is, is above the average female, you know. Um, and I was, you know, born kind of defensive and, and elusive. So what I mean by that is uh, like in a ring, I can feel when someone's building up energy to attack me or um, uh, it's almost as if before he even hits me, he already likes, like, I, I feel him, I, before I ever get touched, I feel him hitting me, kind of. <laughs> it's like a sixth sense, kind of. Like, I have whiskers, like spidey senses or something like that. But, uh, but yeah, so I can feel when his energy is going to build up, you know, and, and the more, uh, the more anxious he gets to get me down, the more he'll start fighting with these emotions and fighting with that energy, and I'll start to feel it more and more. It'll get thicker. So it'll get easier for me to, um, to read and pick up on those uh, those frequencies, uh, however you would say. <laughs> <laughs> I got you there, man. And uh, now I do want to ask one other thing training-wise before we move on here. Uh, so you train at Combat Club in West Palm Beach, Florida. Whenever somebody thinks of a training camp in Florida, I feel like everybody's mind who just gravitates right towards like an American Top Team or a Sanford MMA. Obviously, there's other high-level gyms down there in Florida. Let's talk about the gym a little bit and kind of how they've been helping you grow and evolve as a fighter. Well, yeah, um, I joined their gym a few years back, and they kind of just like gave me the space to work and to be creative and be free, you know. Uh, and I have a friend named uh, Brandon Carroll, and uh, that, that he, me and him are pretty much like, you know, uh, we pretty much study and and review and record and and, and study some more and, and we, we take notes and me and him are like brainiacs when it comes to the sport and we study each other, we study other fighter fighters. Uh, we you know, we learn as much as possible on our own and we bring it back to each other and we and we kind of uh, we kind of feed off of each other and um, that's pretty much 
all it really is, just me and another guy, <laughs> uh, you know, building each other up. Yeah, I get tips from other fighters and stuff like that too here and there. And I have a, I have a coach, uh, a coach figure to me. His name is Dave Zitnick, and I'll go to see him every few weeks, and he'll give me a lot of tips and things like that. Um, the head coach over there, his name is Rodney Brewer. He'll give me tips here and there, you know, but it's really for the majority just me and my friend, uh, Brandon Carroll, we kind of just brainstorm and come up with a uh, – I mean, man, we practice pretty much everything because we believe in be, in, in being humble fighters. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I mean by that is not being so arrogant to the point where you think, hey, because I have a, for example, if, I, if I'm very strong, uh, very heavy-handed, I just rely on my strength to knock everybody out. Me and him believe in, even though you might be gifted at one thing, you still need to work on everything else and try your best to master all areas of fighting because you never know who you're going to get it. Yeah, you might get in there with somebody that you could just knock them out. But what if you get in there with somebody who's stronger than you or somebody who's very, uh, you know, wrestler heavy or we pretty much try to go over every single scenario and uh, try our best to, to learn and grow and see how to, how to beat those types of different fighters and different types of scenarios. So, like, it's a never-ending growing process for us. I understand. That makes sense. It's been obviously working out greatly for you here over the years here. And uh, two more things now that I have for you before we uh, wrap things up. So first one, fights are in Hawaii, right? Great destination spot there. I know we spoke a little bit before we started recording and came on air here to do this interview. You are a big fan of tropical areas. I know you're looking forward to going to Hawaii. Obviously, it's a business trip first. You got to take care of business. But do you plan on staying a little bit and making a little vacation out of it? Yeah, you know, usually they would send me right home right after my fight, like the next morning, six in the morning, I'm out of there. But this time around, I actually told them, hey, I want to uh, stick around for a little bit, so give me a couple extra days. Uh, so um, I'm going home Sunday night. I fight Friday night, and I'm going home Sunday night, so I'll have like an extra day. And it's, and since it's Sunday night, I have, I have pretty much two days to kind of roam around and and mess around and enjoy myself. I got my family coming in as well, so uh, we'll be able to enjoy Hawaii a little bit. Awesome, man. That's good stuff there. And now finally, to just end things here, uh, this is something that you actually talked about earlier, right, about guys getting injured in the tournament, kind of how you were able to work your way into it. I just want to get your thoughts on this. I'm not sure if Bellator has really announced like a long-term plan with all of this. Like, I know Sergio Pettis is out, like James Gallagher is out. Obviously, you know, you guys are in this tournament for a reason. You're all going to chase down this belt. I'm not sure if they're going to make it an interim when it's all said and, and done here. But regardless of how that goes, just, I mean, your thoughts, like when this tournament's all said and done, do you think that, like, people like Sergio Pettis and people like James Gallagher and other people, I know it's been a few other injuries, too, in the last few days, too, with the tournament getting affected there. Is it right if those guys kind of jump right into a title fight when this tournament's all said and done when you guys were the ones that were in it and kind of carried your carried your way through it here so so your question is so after the tournament's done and after the tournament winner fights Sergio Pettis for the belt is it alright if one of them go for the title shot after that yeah pretty much if these guys that are getting injured and are in the tournament they kind of just leapfrog everybody that was in the tournament like is that right in your mind fight for the belt afterwards yeah yeah exactly um, well, that, the, I think they'll be busy still mm -hmm. because I know James Gallagher wants to fight in September. So I think these guys will still stay busy. And if they win a couple fights on the outside, then they'll, they'll earn themselves a title shot, mm -hmm. you know? So it, it, we're not the only ones fighting in the tournament, you know, other guys are still yeah. fighting. So once we're done, then somebody else does deserve a, a chance to fight for the belt too, if they've been busy and winning fights. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that, that doesn't make sense. I didn't even think about that actually. It actually makes a, a lot of great sense. And then too, even if like you are somebody that does get eliminated from the tournament, you're able to kind of keep yourself busy then yeah. and keep fighting and kind of work your way back into it, even though you were actually eliminated from the tournament one time. So that, 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 that does make a lot of sense. So. All right, here's another question then for you, too. As we write a lot of X's and O's like, that I didn't even think about now, and now it's all playing out in my head. When you're doing a tournament like this, do you kind of, like, play it out in your mind? Like, if I win, I go and I fight this person, or if I lose, my next move is here? Because I know in other sports, like in team sports, for example, when you're in a tournament, you kind of, you know, start thinking about these different matchups you might have throughout the tournament here. Yeah, no, but I don't think about what I'm going to do if I lose because I'm very confident. I trust God. <laughs> exactly. I'm going to be honest, like, <laughs> that sounds funny, but, you know, I'm always just trusting God that I'm going to get the win, and what am I going to do when I win, and then what am I going to do after that, you know? Um, 
So, but yeah, it's good to think of, of what your next move and things like that is. But a lot of times you don't know who exactly you're going to fight outside mm-hmm. the tournament that is. In the tournament, you do know who's, the, who's your next opponent. But usually it's such a random, it's so random. You don't know who you're going to fight, you know. Um, but at the, at the top of the weight class, you kind of know, all right, if you're in the top 10, you're probably going to be, if you're, well, if you're like seven and up, you'll probably be fighting like guys in the top 10 still. Mm-hmm. You know, for me, I've been fighting guys outside the top 10. So um, it's been really random, to be honest. You don't really know who you're going to fight against. Gotcha, man. Well, thanks for doing this today. I really appreciate the time. Uh, one last thing now before we roll out, you can go ahead and plug your social media so people know where to follow you at. Uh, if you have any sponsors, management, uh, coaches, teammates, family, friends, whoever you have a shout out to, take it away. The floor is yours. Yeah, uh, I just want to plug my, my Lord and Savior. Um, you know, for me, the most important thing is knowing whether or not somebody's going to die when they, uh, somebody's going to go to heaven when they die. So, um, you know, quick Bible verse the Bible says, the Bible asks one time in the Bible, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. So, according to the Bible, all a person has to do to go to heaven is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He doesn't have to go to church. He doesn't have to be a good person or change his whole lifestyle. All he has to do is trust on Jesus because he died for our sins. He was buried and he rose again the third day. So, um, you know, get saved today, guys, because you never know when your time is going to be up. And uh, you can follow me on Instagram at Lugo and on Twitter at Lugo. Thank you, guys.